everyone. Welcome to week two, set it. Um, I'm just going to get things started um, as soon as possible. We can start with roll call. Um, Ariel, if you can do your thing. Perfect for roll call today. If everyone wants to message in the main chat what they've been working on for ASG. Perfect. So just message in the chat what you've been working on for ASG, and that will be your roll call for the day. Um, and let's move on to the indication. If I could get a volunteer to read out the indication for us. May we, the Student Senate, have the wisdom, patience, and guidance to be responsible representatives. May we be fair in judgments, enlightened in our decisions, and ethical in our actions. Go Broncos. Go Broncos. Thank you, Cassidy. Sniped it away from Theo. Um, um, can we move on to the land acknowledgement right, statement yeah. now? Um, I, I, I can do Theo? Yeah. Thank you. Um, we pause to acknowledge that Santa Clara University sits on the land of the Ohlone and Mukwema Ohlone people who traced their ancestry through the Mission Dolores, Santa Clara and San Jose. We remember their connection to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, learn, and pray on their traditional homeland. Let us take a moment of silence to pay respect to their elders and to all Ohlone people of the past and present. Thank you, Theo. Um, let's move on to the approval of previous minutes. Um, I will, this is last week's minutes. I move to approve the previous minutes. Second. Motion from Monica, second from Abby. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Last week's minutes have been approved. Let's move on to the approval of the agenda. Um, the agenda this week is pretty straightforward. Um, we're gonna start off with um, the, with a quick bylaw amendment um, and it's just the RSO dissolution. Um, I'm pretty sure this is one of the ones that will, that will have to be voted on this week, which will involve um, suspension of standing rules. Um, after that's done, we're gonna move on to the campus safety audit summation. Um, Angel Lynn will be presenting that um, along with maybe some help from Hawad. Um, and then once she's done with that, we'll invite everyone for public comment. If there's any spectators that, or anyone from the general student body that wants to bring forth any questions, that is the time for them to do so. Um, if not, I know for a fact that a lot of us have, have questions of our own um, and it'll just, be a, it'll just be a time for us to kind of put forth all the questions that we have. Um, I know that CSC or Abby your, your committee was kind of going off with different questions. And I think that would be a very good starting point. And then we can kind of go from there. Um, and, and in the meantime, CRO will be compiling these list of questions and kind of triaging it. Um, so when Father O'Brien comes at eight, um, we'll be, he'll, he'll have a couple of minutes to just give, an, give some introductory remarks. Um, I don't really know what he's gonna talk about, but I would assume is kind of the timeline going forward and what we should expect from him and the administration um, regarding um, their response to the safety audit um, and what what promises they can make. Um, and then after that is done, we'll have roundtable remarks around 8.30. Um, so Father O'Brien is scheduled to speak from 8 to 8.20, but I wouldn't be surprised if he stayed a little bit later. Um, so I just, wanted to, I just wanted everyone to keep that in mind. Um, and for roundtable remarks, the biggest thing is really talking about like, we're gonna have, a, we're gonna have an event next week. Um, what do we want that event to look like? And kind of just talking about what we learned today um, and, and then after that's done, we shall adjourn. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Motion to approve the agenda. Um, motion second. from Carmen, second from Theo. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. The agenda has been approved. Let's move on to new business um, with the RSO dissolution bylaw amendment. Um, this is the amendment. Carmen, take it away. Yes. Hey, everyone. Um, so as most of you know, uh, in response to the tweet that went out by the SU College Republicans, they have decided to dissolve. Um, so actually, the president uh, of the College Republicans decided to dissolve. 
And in order for an RSO to dissolve, they must meet in person. So highlighted in bright yellow are the changes that we have been working on in, for the past couple of days. So for an RSO to um, dissolve, they must meet in person. So we're adding the, the change that they can also meet over a virtual setting. Um, in addition to that, uh, these uh, the evidence that they have to provide has to be their signatures and pen. However, we can't do this right now given the current circumstances. And so uh, we, we're resorting to having them having online signatures accompanied by their um, full name and the SCU student ID numbers. And then the last uh, part highlighted in yellow is um, that once an RSO decides to dissolve, they must wait between one to four years um, for them to recharter if they would so like to do that. So yeah, that is basically it. And so if this is approved, then uh, the College Republicans Club could start uh, dissolving this week. Do we have any questions? No? What yeah, is um, Sorry, what is rechartering? And like, what is that process look like? So rechartering, um, I'm actually not sure if that is the correct term but that would mean that uh, a club would have to apply. So in section D, it says that if a club remains inactive, they can dissolve, but then they can just apply again, whereas they would have to wait between one to four years, depending on the reason for going through this process. And then they, they could able to be able to apply again to become an RSO. Would they be able, like would the same group of people be able to apply as like a new RSO, but doing the same thing? Or is that like... Um, so what? most likely, uh, depending on the time frame, the people that were probably there would have graduated. But since it is between one to four years, it's likely that some people who were probably freshmen, uh, first years can probably reapply. Um, so that is what it's looking so right now, because at first I thought four years, but then that might be a little extensive depending on whatever the reason was for the RSO to dissolve. So we, we, want, we want to do this on a more case-by-case -case basis. Does that answer your question, Cassidy? Yeah, and then it would be that it would be your committee that decides the like one to two, to, the, the, the one to four year um, distinction or who so, is deciding that? Um, so I put here Senate um, just for more, more, just to get more representation. Um, it could also be SAC, but I just thought it would be better to get the input of the whole student Senate before so, we um, yes. So just to just to kind of like take a step back, um, this RSO dissolvement process just affects all 180 RSOs. Like this is something that's going to be blanket for every single RSO. Yeah. And then because of that, like the the the, the language we're using is intentionally vague, um, and and by at the discretion of Senate, um, currently like we've kind of like approving and approving RSOs is kind of power that's been vested in us, like uh, of all of Senate, all 28 members, but currently that has been subdivided to just SAC um, and, and whatever process that SAC currently goes through and the, and the process that we that SAC currently goes through is, um, is um, it's, it, it used to be a, it used to be a vote for like, it used to be a vote for all 28 members of Senate, but ever since last year, it's a vote within, um, within SAC, I think. I don't know if I don't know if that's right, Carmen. Um, uh, no, Justin. Thanks for bringing that up. I'm not entirely sure. Um, Ted, are you here? And if so, do you know the answer to this? Or actually, it might be it might be a vote um, at the come spring quarter, but it'll be like a lot of it'll, it'll be a lot of RSOs being approved at the same time. But yeah, Ted. Just for uh, just Lori for, is here as well. Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, for the uh, new RSOs, they're voted on just in the spring. So I, I would say um, instead of recharter, say that uh, to apply to be a new RSO, because then they would go through the provisional student organization process, which I think would be a good process for an RSO who was dissolved instead of getting to skip all of that and basically like renew in a sense since we don't really recharter. Um, so I would say of the dissolvement, dissolvement to apply to be a new RSO or something like that. Got it. Okay. Thanks, Lori. I'll change that. And then, um, with members looking at their contribution, all of that for basically the academic year until they're voted on in the spring. 
Okay. And I think I think when it says at the discretion of Senate, um, every single like whenever whenever an RSO wants to charter, like it, I don't know if someone I, I don't know if we treat RSOs who have dissolved and are trying to recharter differently than RSOs who are just tr trying to charter from the for the very first time. I would assume that it's it's still going to be the same process. And regardless of what that process is, it's always at the discretion of Senate regardless. So really this, the at the discretion of Senate just kind of enumerates like what the normal process is for any chart, for any RSO like chartering. Um, like it's not specifically for, and only for those who are trying to recharter or dissolve the RSO. Okay, got it. Then yeah, yeah, that clears up <laughs> my questions, thank you. All right, go ahead. No, that was just my main question is like, would the rechartering process be the same as like a new RSO going in? I feel like that has answered my question. So thank you. Yes. Okay, perfect. And then um, Ciara, I saw your question. Um, so from my understanding, it is the head, the president of the College Republicans Club, but also a few members and the club is not super, is not, hasn't been really that active at all. So they don't have a lot of um, like members. But um, yeah, so that's what we know so far about that. Okay, yeah. To clarify, we're referring to for everyone else that um, just because the president wants to dissolve, that doesn't mean that they're gonna dissolve. But if there's not many members, then we can assume that they will dissolve. But I just wanna make sure that people know that just because the president wants to dissolve doesn't mean that that's gonna happen for sure. Got it. Um, Zakia, do you have a question? Can you hear me? Okay, so yes. I'm still a little bit unclear as to. Okay, so. So, what is the four years for? So, the one to four years would be the amount of time that the RSO would have to wait to reapply to become an RSO again. Which is oh, the so. Oh, okay, so when they are dissolved, would it be up to Senate to say how long they have to wait to to reapply? Yeah, between the one and four years. So let's say it is dissolved today. So they have to wait a year from today, they can then reapply, or four years from today, they could then reapply. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Of course. I think the question is like, is that is that like one to four year period like determined after the after it's dissolved so like it's like okay now that you're dissolved senate will determine okay you have one year until you can you can recharter or four years till you can recharter or is it kind of something we leave like ambiguously and then it's only when they come back in one to four years that we can choose whether or not they can recharter does that make sense like yeah. there's a little bit of ambigu ambiguity there and i think it could be cleared up so would you like me instead to add something that says um like we'd have to tell them like immediately, like they just, cause they're the ones who decide to dissolve, they come to us and then we tell them one to four years, like have like a written notice or something. Is that what you're referring to, Justin? Yeah, like, and honestly, like it can be up to an hour so that dissolves, like however long they want that period to last um, mm -hmm. in consultation with um, CSI, obviously. Um, but Lori, do you have a suggestion? Yeah, I was going to say, I think the way we wrote it uh, was written was at least one year. So technically, the way the bylaws are written now, they could just any RSO can dissolve right now in the winter, and then they could reapply to be a new RSO in the spring. So that's why it's adding this. So it's saying like, at least one year, so they can't just immediately the next time renewals are around or a new RSOs apply, they have to wait the one year. And then we're saying no longer than four years. So after that four year process, they would have to um, probably go through like the brand new RSO process and everything. So I think it would be good to keep that at least one year so they know that like they can't immediately become an RSO right away. Um, and then the four so, years, I, I don't so know. Just to, so just to clarify, so the timeline kind of is, um, the one year is for, okay, if you dissolve, you won't be able to recharter that same year. Um, but say another group of students wanted to recharter this organization or any organization, um, because this RSO existed in the past, 
they, they would go through a less rigorous process. So the rechartering or, or the rechartering of this organization would be, or, or, or of any organization would be like easier than saying chartering like in the first place. Um, but after four years, if no one has one, no one has wanted to recharter this organization, any organization in four years, then it's strict to okay. There's no there's no rechartering. It's just chartering from brand new. Um, I think more uh, of how it was written here was saying like it between the one and four years because I I had suggested like four years, which if you look at some of the bylaws, we um or some of kind of like the guidelines, it's four years so that, like, let's say for instance, now there's a first year student that could be involved in, in an RSO that is trying to be dissolved. We have that four year time frame, so that hopefully anyone who was involved or was an e-board member has graduated. And so that that's where the four year timeline came from. Um, so it might need to clarify at least one year and then figure out what that four year language was, but that's where the four years came from. And then yeah. it was decreased to one year. So it might just need to clarify because after the four years, they would apply to be a new RSO again, but they would go through the same process if they were dissolved and two years from now, they wanted to become an RSO, they would go through the new RSO process again, uh, especially because they were dissolved. I wouldn't want it to be an easier process for them. I would want them to go through the exact same new RSO process because we walk through their constitution, their members, their recruitment, like all of those things. I wouldn't want them to skip any steps because they were dissolved. So if it's the same exact process, could we just could we just delete the line, um, but no longer than four years at the discretion of Senate, just make it so that they would only they would have to wait one year and it's automatically assumed that after this one year, they would have to go through the same exact rigorous process as the same as if it was like a brand new RSO. Uh, I think you're confusing. I don't know. This what I'm understanding is let's separate it into two separate um, items. There's the process, like if whether it's one to four years or two years, whatever the timeline is, there's the process of, okay, this RSO wants to come back. Let's just say it's a photography club. The photography club wants to come back after being dissolved. They would just go through the same process that they that any new RSO would go through. There's no, it's not stricter, it's not less strict. It's just the same process that any new RSO would go through. Um, the one to four years is a standard that um, Lori and I are familiar with, particularly with Greek life. Whenever they, um, it's usually whenever they suspend the fraternity or sorority, it usually is between four and five years. Um, but in earlier conversation with Carmen and Robbie and a few other students, it was, we didn't want it to be punitive, especially like, for example, the last time we dissolved a group was the ski club and it was just because they just wanted to be independent so why make them wait four years if it was really kind of a benign reason that they dissolved um so I hope that helps add a little bit more clarity or things for you to consider cassidy and i think we're i want to cap it at cassidy so last question okay i was just wondering whether or not the rso would know about um the one to four years before they vote to dissolve or whether that decision would be made after they vote to dissolve? Like, are they making that um, dissolve vote as an informed decision or not as knowing whether or not the Senate would be imposing one to four years? I would recommend it has to be made at the same time. It's an informed decision. Just because the, but you as the current Senate or whoever the current Senate is needs all the facts and information at that time. And you don't want to make it a deferred decision where let's say it's sent um, a sent a group of senators two years from now, they may not know everything or not have all the facts besides maybe whatever is documented. Um, but it's also just tradition, it's just how things are done with when you're um, suspending a Greek letter organization. Um, usually the term of how long they're suspended is done at the same time of when the decision is rendered. So I think in terms, I think in terms of recommendations for changes for here, um, I think the only change is maybe adding adding some language clarifying that, however long, whether it's one to four years, this is, this has to be like set in stone, 
like once an RSO chooses to dissolve, the question is, does that need to be done in the bylaw here or is that already assumed um, in like a separate clause? I think the best thing would be to add it right there on E as like a little section, like it must be decided whatever like the time frame is so that the RSO can know ahead of time. I think what would be most, uh, most likely to happen is that I don't think an RSO would want to recharter like a year or two after, but if that does happen, like we can tell them like, oh, you have to wait two or three years to recharge, to reapply to be an RSO. I think that that would be a good addition. So yeah. Um, does does that does determined at the time of dissolvement? Does that seem clear enough? I'm sorry, Justin. I know that you said you wanted that to be the last question, but I really do have a question. Go for it. Okay. So it. So what if they? what if a club does something bad 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 right and then they say okay we're gonna dissolve and then we say okay you're gonna have to wait three years and then they say well we're not dissolving anymore then what can we make them dissolve Dis dissolution i don't know um ted do you happen to know the answer to that or Can you repeat the question, please? So I was saying in the case that we, the club wants to dissolve and then uh -huh. um, they tell them how long they would have to wait to dissolve or to recharter, to reapply, whatever, to become a club again, to apply to become a, cup, a club sure. again. And then the club chooses uh -huh. not to do that anymore because they don't want to wait that long. Is there a way if the club has done something bad to, for us, to make them dissolve anyways? Um, it's something I need to explore a little bit more, to be honest, just because um, it's, it's a question that a lot of other students have asked me. And I, I don't have a, to be honest, I, I, it's something that's a little bit beyond my scope uh, to answer that um, thoroughly. Um, I guess my, my, my gut reaction is that you you want to have as much evidence as possible um and if they are dissolved or if they're going through the process and they don't garner enough votes by their own membership to dissolve then that's the decision because the, their members decided hey we don't want to dissolve but if the reason is egregious um, there could be something where the university um i have to look i i don't have the student handbook in front of me but uh, i know there's a clause where if they violate certain part if they basically violate any policy in the student handbook or even any university policies in the university policy, a uh, university um, does have the discretion to revoke them, uh, but it has to be pretty egregious. So um, I, yeah, it's a, it's very nuanced language that would have to be in there. So I don't have, I, I don't have a, a perfectly wordsmith answer for you right now, but I'd have to consult with others to make sure that it is, um, perfect in terms of the, the wording and make sure it is legally feasible. Yeah. Um, Sorry, that was a very I'm, convoluted answer. <laughs> um, I guess I'll table the discussion for now. I think we have enough information to vote on this resolution now. Um, I would entertain a motion to suspend the standing rules so we can vote, vote on this tonight. Motion to suspend the standing rules. Um, motion from Christina, I think. Second. Second from Marielle. Um, all in favor, say aye. Or all in favor, please raise your hand. Just sent out a message in the chat, but is there a reason we have to um, it tonight? So the reason it needs to be done sooner rather than later is because um, there is a specific um, RSO that wants to dissolve college Republicans and the process cannot start and it's not allowed to start 
um, until we change the bylaws. So right now they're kind of in a in a weird like what's the word? You, I think you know what the word I'm thinking of. Limbo. Limbo yes. Um, so so the earlier the earlier we can change the bylaws, the quicker the process will start. Um, okay, and yeah. Looks like the document is not finished. Like there's highlights and comments and things. So are we voting on the comments? Or are we voting? On so we, we would be voting on everything. So basically everything that's yellow. And, and I guess I'll define that now. Um, the standing the standing rules have been suspended for the day. Um, for I mean for for the vote, um, I would entertain a motion to to vote. And specifically, we're voting on on um, implementing all of these changes, including including the yellow highlights. And the yellow highlights are the changes. Um, I will lower all hands now. But no, yes, I would entertain a motion to vote. A motion to vote. Um, motion from Emma, second from Vanessa. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Perfect. If you would like to approve this bylaw amendment to the RSO dissolvement process, um, please raise your hand. Perfect. Um, this um, this bylaw has now been amended. Has now been amended. Judicial or Robbie, I assume you would take take things from here. Um, okay. Moving on. We will now move on to. Um, special orders of business, and we'll start off with a campus safety audit summation um, led by Angel Lynn. Okay, hi guys. Um, if you were at the ISAC event yesterday, we are recycling the presentation, but it's okay because I promise I'll try to be super fast and engaging. Let's go. Okay, so yes, we'll just start out with um, this. The audit is broken up in multiple parts. So first we're gonna start out with the history and structure of campus safety. In 1979, public service safety or public safety services was established because the contract that Santa Clara had with Wells Fargo security company um, expired. So we created our own um, unit. And then in 1986, the officers petitioned to carry batons and mace, which they did not carry before and they do not carry now. If you read into the details, there's a fun little story about one of the officers um, faking an attack so that like it would help their argument, but you know, all's well that ends well. And then in 1986, former police chief Richard Damon restructures and reorganizes the chain of command to the command that we have today with the four watch commanders. And then in 2000, public safety services is named or is renamed to public or campus safety services that we know and love today. Um, and then just breaking down the campus safety structure, uh, we have patrol, emergency planning, and parking and transportation. Patrol is the one that we know of most familiarly, familiarly with John Loretto being um, the leader and with four watch commanders, all of which, by the way, are men, two of which are people of color, but um, and five assistant watch commanders and 13 CS officers. And then um, this is just an overview of the budget. As you can see, it's 2,600,000. And then uh, we're going over the arrests and activities real quick. With 45 arrests on average per year made by Santa, or by the campus safety officers. And then, um, but these are actually citizens arrests and the actual arrests are made by Santa Clara police officers. In addition, these are just like a general summary of the arrests that were made. Obviously alcohol violations are gonna be the most prominent, but there's also a lot of notable arrests made for drug or for trespassing and suspicious persons with only 11 being for theft. Um, we also went into some observation or some feedback that uh, Judge Cordell uh, looked into um, in regards to campus safety with 64% of undergrads, 61% of alumni having a negative view with staff and faculty actually having a positive view, but undergrads and alumni are the ones who have the most exposure to campus safety. Um, this was actually a notable story that I know a lot of people have been discussing. Um, it goes, one day in the summer, I was playing a game with some friends at their house off campus across from Swig, where most girls are playing, staying as part of the girls' soccer camp. Most of us were black, and after a campus or a camp counselor came over to question us if we had a gun or not, we didn't and told her no. A few minutes later, a campus safety officer starts patrolling in front of Swig, staring us down. Instead of talking to us and clearing things up, the police are called. Uh, here's another story about a student ambassador coming from an alumni who says that they were told explicitly from campus safety that it was okay to racially profile young black men and women who clearly didn't belong on campus. 
And then here are some conversations that Campus Safety had with um, Judge Cordell directly before the incident of August 2020 and also the uh, diversity forum incident during the fall quarter diversity forum. It was like super chilling, everything was great. Like Campus Safety was like, this is the greatest place to work, we're a big family. But now as you can see, there's a lot more tension between Campus Safety and the president in particular, saying that the president is one-sided and um, threw Campus Safety on the, the bus and was unsupportive of Campus Safety. And so like, we're kind of seeing some issues there. Um, and then there's this one quote that talks about how campus safety officers um, very true, adamantly held onto their belief that they were not racist and that they performed their work in a colorblind manner. And also that um, campus safety serve, or employees were required to attend an implicit bias training shortly after the August 22nd, 2020 interaction. But some of them, while they did find the training was helpful, others felt that it was a form of discipline and a few felt that it was a waste of time. Also, John Loretto did not want to talk to Judge Codell. So <laughs> um, here are some of the important findings that came from the campus safety audit. Um, Judge Cordell found that there was a mixed message disconnect and while campus safety off um, like sort of markets itself as the department of yes and sort of tries to be a very much customer service based one it's primarily one that is interpreted as law enforcement focus a lot of us do see campus safety officers as exactly officers and cops and this mixed message has alienated some students and faculty who view campus safety officers solely as enforcers there's also definitely a racial disconnect um in especially calling attention to the fact that many of these uh, campus safety officers say that they operate with a colorblind mindset. And while the colorblind mindset is ideal and it looks or sounds nice, it's actually impossible to achieve. Um, Judge Cordell also found that there was a need for racial and gender diversity positions. Campus safety services has never been led by a woman and all of the directors and assistant directors have been white males, um, with the exception of the current director who is biracial, who is Caucasian and Latinx. Um, and of the nine command watch staff positions for watch, uh, only one is female. And then something that Judge Cordell really did emphasize was that there is a stronger need for transparency. Um, currently, the rules and regulations that, and the policy manual that campus safety uses is not available to the SCU community. Um, also, there is a, the SCU community is basically in the dark about what campus safety services do, does. And then there's also no real way for campus safety to actually like or for students to know what the activity of campus safety is, except for this exact moment. Um, she also said that there was a need for feedback, uh, including the complaints. They need to adopt a procedure that allows for students to like complain immediately after an engagement with campus safety. Um, there's also a need for campus surveys and or online feedbacks. There's never been a campus-wide survey about um, the uh, services initiated by campus safety. And so that's just definitely something that she says needs to be done. There's also definitely a need for um, mental health issues to be trained on. There were no mental health professionals on site for any of the welfare checks that campus safety has performed throughout the year. And it doesn't appear that campus safety officers undergo any mental health training. Um, and so here are some of the recommendations. Um, the big point that uh, Judge Cordell likes or has made is that she wants to reimagine campus safety with a holistic approach. And it, one that really does um, focus primarily on away from student or from enforcement to a focus on campus safety and actual student wellness and whether or not this is done by a shift under the office of student life is something that she suggests but isn't exactly super clear on. Um, she also has some other significant recommendations. These are just a few of them. Um, the replacement of law enforcement military title positions with non-law enforcement military titles, discontinuing the use of handcuffs and law enforcement type badges, discontinuing the use of room searches, um, and then determining if campus or surveillance cameras ought to be used 24-7. I actually did not know we were monitored 24-7, but you know. And then um, to review and reevaluate the campus trespass policy, because that policy in particular has been used a lot to um, hurt a lot of BIPOC community members and then include students on this reimagined department staff. In addition, here are a few more. We, he, um, Judge Cordell argues that we ought to ensure that the recruitment, promotion, and retention policies for the imagined department uh, promotes diversity with respect to race, ethnicity, age, gender, sexual orientation, and then require periodic anti-bias and implicit bias training for all personnel, which also I find kind of questionable given that a lot of the personnel currently did see that as like a punishment technique and saw it as a waste of time. So I don't know. Um, and also require a minimum of an associate's degree or equivalent education for all hires. 
Um, also that to make sure that um, the reimagined police department or department's policies and procedures are available for the entire community to ac access and also to prepare and submit an annual comprehensive campus safety report to the president and maintaining an official history of campus safety. Um, oh yeah, yeah, and here are a few more recommendations done by Judge Cordell, including providing an intake of complaints and misconducts against campus safety personnel by someone outside of campus safety. That person will also conduct investigations of those complaints and make findings. The current process actually makes it so that anyone who complains about campus safety complains to a member of campus safety to be reviewed by other campus safety members. So that is problematic. And then there is also a need to create an immediate feedback process for individuals who had had interactions with the reimagined department. In addition to conducting periodic campus-wide surveys and including mental health professor professionals in the reimagined department's on-site response team. And then I think Hawad's gonna go over a few things that are left out of the budget or the audit. Yeah, thank you, Angel. So uh, a few key points that are just kind of uh, either touched upon, referred to, or actually entirely left out. I'll try to specify how that applies and where. Um, so recommendations are not made in the audit regarding residence life and CSS. Obviously, this is one of the primary locations you may have interacted with them yourself or other students have on issues like lockouts or uh, issues of policy violations within residence life, which obviously has its own governance structure, its own handbook, and about the way students should behave um, and how uh, documentation occurs in those buildings. Um, Accountability with regards specifically to the incident last summer with uh, Dr. Morgan, as well as the um, as well as the imagery that appeared at the Fall Quarter Diversity Forum with the Assistant Director of CSS, John Loretto. Again, um, Angel notes that from the report, uh, the Assistant Director of our University CSS did not actually um, comply or or cooperate with the audit for us to be able to have um, that perspective. We do have some perspective from. Uh, Mr. Beltran, who is the director. Um, note the budget in the CSS audit is hovers in the mid two uh, million range, two to four point two point four to two point six million dollars. Uh, this reimagining with a holistic approach actually does indicate um, the extent to which the department's endowment in that sense is going to become more or less. Obviously, um, some changes in recruitment, addition of students makes one wonder whether we're going to have a bigger or smaller staff. Um, and finally, specific personnel changes are not um, made clear. Again, Judge Cordell wasn't necessarily saying in the audit, this is who we should hire and fire, um, but uh, something that, that does stand out. And also, while changes in the recruitment and reimagining of imagery and philosophy are mentioned, um, we don't get an explicit mention of the re future recruitment of ex-law enforcement, which uh, when we're trying to understand this holistic reimagination and move away from policing more towards community care is something I think students should take seriously, um, given the fact that a lot of our leadership at this time are ex-law enforcement in CSS. So some things to look at. Um, and personally, so all of these things stood out in my own experiences as a CF in residence life, as someone who worked in parking and transportation, again, next door to CSS, having a lot of interactions with the rank and file of the department as well as having a few personal confrontations myself with CSS while actually um, campaigning and expressing some speech on campus. So um, students interact with CSS in different ways um, and that impacts our understanding of them. As we know, uh, monitoring, like Angel said, happens all the time. So uh, we're always being watched on campus. Not all the other Je Jesuit schools uh, do this, something to consider. Um, as we talk about advocacy going forward, uh, as well as as well as funding and the budget in the future. So thank you, Angel. And yeah, um, we'll open things up for well, this is kind of the public comment. Um, we have about 20 minutes for this. Um, and Ciara, do you want to take things from here? Yeah, thanks, Justin. Thanks a lot, and Angel, super insightful. Sorry you had to kind of rush through that. Um, OK. One quick thing I just want to differentiate. There's the investigation, the audit, the investigation is supposedly being wrapped up. And once all of that information, it's supposedly a hundred page document that'll go to two like kind of panels, almost like juries. And they're going to make like the final decision about where to go from here. And that's not under Father O'Brien's control. 
So conversations about kind of like, why wasn't the Dr. Morgan incident included? That is really solely to the investigation in terms of John Loretto incident at the ISAC forum last quarter. Now that I could understand why that like maybe should have been addressed, but also Loretto declined to speak. So just wanted to clear that up in terms of um, questions. Um, I am typing everything. Um, if you didn't say, if you wanted me to ask on your behalf or not in your question, and I haven't asked you directly, can you please follow up on your question saying I, I will ask or I won't ask? Um, but yeah, I wanna, let's open the floor. I know there's some non-ASG folks present as well. Um, so if anyone wants to raise their hand and speak, um, please do so. Um, but I can go through kind of some of the topics that seem to be coming up um, and also senators. I don't know if any senators would like to speak. I just wanna give priority to our constituents. Um, but if, if no one, from non-ASG wants to speak, then we can do our constituents. I mean, all of you senators. Yeah, um, I think it would be helpful if you could kind of, or just taking a step back, I think like personally the biggest, like what I wanna get out of this, like first these next 20 minutes with Father O'Brien is just clarity over what they've been working on and kind of what to expect from them um, over these next couple of weeks. Um, but Ciara, like, can you kind of go over a summary of the questions that you have, given that um, yeah. there aren't any questions? Yeah, definitely. Or comments? I'm still um, jotting some down, but from what I have so far, um, someone will be asking about the balance between restructuring the whole org while also holding the individuals accountable in the two specific incidents. So. I guess in this case, we can just focus on the John Loretto incident because the investigation info has not come out yet. Um, from the audit, it seems that relationship with CSS, Father O'Brien's relationship with CSS is strained and individuals call into question his leadership ability. How will he go about dealing with the relationship with CSS so that change is effective, efficient, will actually get done? How does he envision a holistic approach to redesign CSS without fully removing it? Will the university plan on limiting campus safety's presence on campus by funding resources that are proactive rather than reactive? What is the justification behind not reporting on CSS activities and the budget um, as in some sort of annual report? Um, I actually, for that question, I would like some follow-up about is it, are you referring to kind of would you want an annual report issued to the university by campus safety? Just to clarify, um, uh, the audit mentioned, has there been any consequences for the people involved in the incidents? That kind of will kind of ignore that for now, given the situation with the investigation. A recommendation is to include students on the reimagined department staff. Would these students be compensated for their work? Are there any students that would automatically have a role i.e. is she president. Um, I've also heard a general discomfort, not necessarily related to the report about working with interact or interacting often with CSS because they don't feel safe. How are they going to ensure that these students will be safe and heard? The recommendation includes periodic mental health, anti-bias, implicit bias trainings and campus-wide surveys. How would they define periodic? Is that every year, every quarter? Um, and to reiterate, if you would like to say anything off any of these questions or provide anything else, feel free to raise your hand. Um, in the event that any of the recommendations for CSS can, for any of the recommendations for CSS provided by Judge Cordell are not or cannot be fulfilled, can you commit to providing justification and reasoning behind those decisions? Um, I think I said everything. If I didn't, let me know because you guys asked a lot of questions, which I appreciate. Um, I also want, so Anne and I met with Father O'Brien yesterday briefly about a lot of other things. And he just mentioned how he, he doesn't really have anything to say in the sense of like, he's gonna give like a kind of, here's what's going on at the moment. Here's how we're gonna approach this audit. But his purpose in coming here is actually really to get questions um, answered from y'all, which is great. And two, to ensure that, 
or he's getting feedback as well. So you don't have to limit your commentary to just questions. Um, any feedback would be provided. I know he invited his chief of staff, Molly McDonald, to come and take notes, which he's been doing at the other meetings as well. Um, and if we don't get to everything tonight, um, I'm sure I talked to Jeannie today and she said that she, we can get all these questions down so that they have direct answers to, to send back to us and we can post that on the ASG Instagram or whatever. That's, that's it for me, honestly. Um, if anyone has anything else to, to say, I would love to hear general feelings about the audit um, from all of you, given the, the pulse of, of your constituents over the last week. I was just gonna say, in terms of feedback, it might be willing. It, it might be good to share the um, what Hawad went over about, like what we noticed was missing from the audit, and so those are like additional matters that he should probably be thinking of and keeping in mind um, in terms of feedback to give to Father O'Brien. If we want to share that like slide or in some way get that feedback to him, or if someone wants to share that information. Yeah, I think that's a good idea for sure. Yeah, um, it doesn't, again, if you guys have, if you have a comment or a question or anything you want to say at all, just raise your hand and I can call on you. Um, actually, I'm actually curious, Ted, I know you're on Staff Senate, um, and I know Staff Senate met with Father O'Brien earlier today. Um, could you give a brief summary of like kind of what he talked about or any like new information like you, you gleaned from that, from that meeting, I guess? Uh, I'm actually not on staff Senate. Um, just as an okay. employee at staff, I'm I'm technically a member of Senate uh, staff Senate. I'm just not uh, a senator or anything like that. Um, but it was an open session. I don't know if Lori attended. Um, I wasn't able to attend because I was uh, a guest speaker at a class, a religious studies class at the time. So sorry, I can't answer your question. Okay. No, that's fine. No, I I, I just assumed, but I guess I assumed incorrectly. Um, but yeah, um, I think, or it's Sarah. Would we like to then discuss briefly right now about kind of regardless of what happens tonight, where do we go from here in terms of next week's event and kind of using this audit as another launching pad to ensure that we are holding admin accountable in our various committees and branches by figuring out what's the best way to approach like an event next week, what would we like to see? What do you think our, um, like the student body would like to see? Yeah, um, I guess I could kick things off. I, I think my, my primary concern is like, since the, or, or, or since um, like the first, the first, since what happened with Dr. Morgan um, and what happened at the ISAC forum, like there's like, every single time we've talked to the administration, they're like, oh, okay, wait for the audit. Oh, okay, wait for the investigation. And I feel like it's kind of been um, a way for the university to, or for the administration to kind of stall, which is like fine. Like I, I understand like they need to put together all of this like information. And like, now that it's out, like, where do we go from here? I'm, I'm, I'm worried that like, there hasn't been a lot of student in, it doesn't seem like there was a lot of student input like in the past quarter in terms of you know like students being involved in this reimagination of campus safety, um, and now that this audit is out, I'm worried that okay, like we're only going to have these next two weeks to remain involved in the process, and then for the next two quarters, we're not going to be involved at all, um, and that's kind of a fear that I have. I, I I don't think the administration like wants it to be that way, but because of it, I, I just don't really know like how involved we are going to be in the process, and I would like to you know. Kind of pose a question like how involved do we want to be in the process would we like weekly updates would we want you know more of these types of forums would we want um would we want the university or the administration to to tell us kind of what changes they're going to implement before they implement them or do we want it to be kind of a reactionary thing right like how involved are we going to be in the process or and really the question i'm posing is how involved should we be in the process Um, I think an important thing is going to be um, holding whatever the timeline is and holding administration accountable to that timeline and whatever next steps um, they have. 
I think that I, I mean, I would love to maintain and like stay within the process. I think that that's an important thing for us to do, at least to be knowledgeable about it. I don't know if that means like weekly updates or bi-weekly updates or making sure that whatever the timeline looks like, we are meeting regularly on those important dates. Um, but I think a lot of our next steps are gonna depend on what we learn today and what we learn in the next week. So I don't know if that answers your question a lot, but I think we also are kind of playing the waiting game because we also don't know what the future looks like. I think that um, at this point, it would be at least to some effect restorative if SE would consider how students feel in their next steps. So if they were to, you know, try to get student feedback on what they were going to do before they did it, just so we feel like we are being considered, because up until this point, like it's been said, you know, we've just been kind of waiting. But I also definitely agree with Cassidy in that we we kind of they, they haven't said what they want to do. They haven't really said anything about it yet. So we don't even know their position on it yet. We don't know if they're taking what Judge Cordell said seriously. And that is frustrating. And so I do think it's really, really important that we are we are holding them accountable to them just doing anything, honestly, at this point, which isn't, which I also feel like isn't that cool, because now we just want to see something. But that aside, you know, yeah, I feel like there, I feel like it's really difficult that this is a really difficult thing for us to have to deal with, because I don't feel like they want to do that much about it at this point. One. Yeah, uh, I think that one uh, really, I guess, uh, pressure point for me at the moment, uh, I think it was kind of touched on in the presentation, but um, it's a little hard for me to get my head around why uh, there hasn't been a sort of dramatic change in the operation of CSS in such a way that we've seen across the rest of campus, given like the closure and like kind of just reshuffling of how we operate entirely. I mean, we have a very minimal amount of student workers, very negligible amount of faculty and staff on campus. And yet it, it does seem like the operations of CSS specifically seem a little bit untouched. And in some ways this is connected to what the audit is looking to identify and the issues we are trying to ameliorate. But for me, it also, just brings up the fact that it seems like they're just rolling with the same punches that they had uh, when things were normal. Um, and that seems like a misuse of university resources and tuition paid to the university. And um, it's very difficult to reconcile this because I realize that so much of that budget goes to the compensation of CSS workers and that the actual operating budget besides that compensation is very small. I mean, we saw that on the slide. It's like majority goes to just paying people. Um, so uh, I'm, I don't think this is something we should necessarily use time with Father O'Brien tonight with, um, but a thought that continues to stick out to me and something that potentially I will interrogate myself or, or uh, seek an answer for is uh, why, why exactly does it seem like CSS is, does not have a different plan in the same way that all of us have different plans and faculty and staff have different plans and situation uh, right now. Um, are there any live? I, I don't want to interrupt. Brian is here. I arrived, so I didn't, know whether Brian. You, I didn't know whether you were waiting for me. So here I am. Whenever you're ready, it's fine. Cool. Yeah. Um, we, we could start things early, but before we go, are there any last questions, comments, concerns that anyone wants to bring up? Um, if not, I would like to invite Father O'Brien onto the floor. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Justin. And uh, thanks uh, to uh, Sierra and Anne for their leadership and all of our senators and HG. So thank you. Um, so I, as you know, from my email from last week, I'm visiting uh, various, um, so there's in, in our governance on campus, there's a formal uh, bodies within governance. So I'm visiting the faculty senate, the staff senate, and in this case, our student senate. I've also reached out to um, other student leaders uh, to talk. So um, uh, through the MCC and ISAC and IGWE. Um, also happy to meet with other groups um, or leaders as helpful. Uh, and also we'll meet with campus safety. So my, the, the whole point of this is actually just to, is to listen. I'm happy to answer any questions if, if you wish, but also just really wanna listen for feedback um, because my intention is to receive uh, feedback and then you know, uh, make decisions because we wanna, it's very important that we, that we, that we act, right? That, we, that, we, that I make a decision explain why and that we act, that we move forward. And uh, so I wanna allow for consultation and feedback, but don't wanna to delay too, too long um, as we make decisions. Um, and as I do, as you can see from the report, I'm, I trust you've, you've read it, there, there are sort of high level um, recommendations that Judge, Cador, uh, Judge Cordell made and sort of very, very specific ones. And in a sense, part of my listening is to help me prioritize, like what do we do first? Um, the, the, the big one is, you know, looking at a more holistic approach to campus safety, which um, better balances a, uh, uh, sort of what, what she found an overemphasis on law enforcement and more of an emphasis on student wellness, student concern, student safety in the, in the, in the real breadth of what that word means, student belonging. Um, and one of the concrete suggestions is uh, sort of moving organizationally, moving campus safety under student life. As you are all students and our student leaders, it'd be helpful for me to hear from you what are the pros and cons of that. Um, Judge Cordell certainly knows about universities. She was at Stanford in two different capacities for over a decade, so she understands universities. Not very familiar with Santa Clara, so we want to make sure any decision is really reflective of, of Santa Clara and is best for us. Um, the, but that's sort of, that's a big one. Um, uh, and she indicates reasons for making that move as a way uh, to a better, that campus safety can better serve the community. So that's just one, that, that, that first recommendation on reimagining campus safety with a more holistic approach. Um, there are lots of other specific recommendations which are more operational um, some of those have already begun, for instance, uh, developing a more extensive and cohesive training program. So we're already developing that. Um, there's some recommendations that you may have that are not in the report. So one that uh, has emerged over the last week is, you know, developing, um, in a sense, an advisory council, uh, uh, which uh, is a way for camp safety to receive feedback. So one of the issues that you know emerged uh, and that was identified is there needs to be a, a more consistent feedback mechanism for campus safety to do its job better and to better serve the community. So um, uh, that advisory board would be one of them. So the audit of campus safety was the first of its kind in campus safety's history and you saw some of the history there. Um, so it, it was been long overdue um, and um, the, the, my, in, my intention or what will happen is that like other parts of the university, so in student life, almost every part of student life, there's a, there's a review every few years, sort of a mega review every few years, often with an outside people coming in and examining and sharing best practices, getting student feedback regularly, getting feedback from others on campus. So and that happens sort of regularly in academia and it just hasn't happened in campus safety and that's on us. So what I imagine is the audit is just sort of the first of what will be a regular practice of feedback on the meta level, sort of a bigger examination. And then, which I think is necessary and which we've already begun to examine is, well, what about ongoing feedback, right? And this is good practice for any university or any business is how do we give regular feedback to, um, uh, uh, to those who want to serve better, right? So um, after, in a sense, we can ask after every interaction with campus safety, is there a way to give feedback? There's a, another university that has one of those little oh, codes that 
So a business card is given to a student after any interaction, positive, it doesn't, doesn't matter what the interaction is, and there's a, a barcode that they can scan and they can give immediate feedback. Our, our information systems, our, our university information system staff does that with every interaction. They get immediate feedback about, so how do we do? Did we help or not? So I think that's one of the things that we're already working on. So some recommendations are sort of easy to act on. Some are gonna take more time because we need more input, particularly from students because of the concerns that have been expressed. And we need to feel understand from you, well, wh what's the best way to address those concerns in the right way for Santa Clara? Um, and I think just bigger picture, um, consider the audit as part of my ongoing commitment to greater transparency and accountability. So that's a very important priority for me. There's really two that I'm thinking about all the time, greater access and affordability to Santa Clara and greater accountability and transparency. So with the audit is one example, but you hopefully you had a chance to, to review the Ohlone History Working Group report, which was a year long effort. And they and, and we, we, we had a, an event in, on, in December, which the working group talked about their work. And then we're gonna to begin to sort of work through those recommendations. You know that we uh, launched a new dashboard an advancing racial justice dashboard. And the purpose of that dashboard is to track what we have now counted as over 500 initiatives, both large and small, which are advancing our goal of being an anti-racist university because we need to track our progress. And that, that has not been done well the last few years. So we have a task force, we have committees, there are recommendations, but we don't, we don't go back to you and say, how are we doing? And so that dashboard actually is, allows us to say progress, in progress or no progress. And so that type of accountability is what I'm really, really committed to. So um, let me stop there. And, and, and uh, I don't know how we manage this, Justin, but uh, just hearing feedback or uh, answering questions. I can take it, Justin. Um, hi, Father Thank Brian, you. thanks Hello, for doing this. Sierra. Sure. Um, so what we're going to be doing is I'm just gonna call on some folks and then they have already provided some questions and then okay. we'll see if other people send in some feedback or whatnot. Great. Um, Great. Okay, Abby, go for it. Hi, Father O'Brien. Thank you Hello, for having us. I'm up here. Um, so my question is kind of about balancing what you were just talking about with the audit, which is recommendations for structural change, which I'm really glad was focused on. I think that's how the biggest changes will be made, um, but also kind of remembering and honoring that um, this audit and the supplemental investigation um, rose out of two really specific incidents, which were the incident with Dr. Morgan and then the Blue Lives Matter flag at the diversity forum. Um, and I know that there's already a separate investigation happening for the incident with Dr. Morgan, um, but I guess I'm just wondering how um, you plan to kind of balance the individual accountability that's necessarily necessary as well. Um, I guess my concern reading the audit is that um, even if we make these changes where we move campus safety under a different department or um, kind of dress them to look less like police, that if in their minds they didn't see like something wrong with what happened the first times, um, you know, some commented that the diversity trainings were a waste of time. Um, John Loretto, who was most directly involved, he was the one with the flag, didn't comment in the audit. Um, I guess I'm just wondering how we can make sure that the people right. who are, um, you know, within the organizations are being held accountable as well. Right. And so I think that's, 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 our, that, that's my job. That's a job of whoever, whatever organizational structure they fit into. But I think you're absolutely right. And so what we want to be clear about is, and that's why there's a recommendation to look at position descriptions, which is basically, I have a position description. I'm accountable for that, right? And that's how I measure. That's how I keep my job or not. So I think it's for public safety to be very clear. Okay, this is our ethos. This is our expectation, and 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 we need to, we will hold you accountable to that. And um, uh, so I think that's I think I would say that for anyone who works at the university. But to go to your question, th that's the point. The the training is a very important, and that's one of the recommendations. And the training can't be just a one-off, right? I mean, Jennifer Eberhardt, uh, who at Stanford for me is the best at this. She wrote the book um, Biased and we relied on her for various trainings, including of the cabinet at Santa Clara, my cabinet. Um, but the training has to be ongoing. She says, you know, it's, it can't be once. Culture, minds, hearts, it takes some time. Um, 
there has to be openness. If there's not openness to change, then 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 there's there, there must be a parting of ways. But if there's an openness, a desire for change, a desire to learn, then 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 I could just say that generally that we can work with that. But I think that the training has got to be ongoing. It just can't be a one-off. And and the culture change, this is really what we're looking at is a, is a culture change. And that's gotta come both from the top by example, but also ground level. So I think what needs to happen, frankly, is you know, conversations between students and campus safety um, uh, that are, you know, for those who want to, uh, that, are, that are productive and, um, and helpful so that campus safety understands better uh, not just a mediated voice, what I could say, but what they can hear directly from uh, students in this case. So, um, yeah, so I think, I think you're absolutely right. Individual accountability and sort of a cultural change um, have to happen at the same time. You mentioned the, the, the incident, so the, the, the audit, uh, I announced the audit after the incident involving campus safety and the Morgan family in August. So I think a week later I announced the audit and we committed, it would be a four month audit. Um, uh, so just so you know, and there's been some confusion, uh, when the incident occurred, I, uh, under our, um, what's called Title IX, which some of you might be familiar with, it's a process for alleging uh, any kind of harassment on campus, sexual harassment, uh, harassment based on race or another protected category that under, under the law and under the, the rules adopted by Santa Clara applying federal law, and that was adopted by students and faculty and staff last summer, there's a process. And what I did is I say, well, let's get an independent investigator who will look at that. So there's no interference from me or anyone else. And, and once I did that, um, I, I, don't have, I don't have control over that investigator. They have freedom to do it. So what that investigator is doing, and Belinda Guthrie, who's the head of our Title IX office, she in a sense is in dialogue with the investigator who will who will uh, file a not file who will complete a report. We'll give it to both parties. Both parties can comment on the report, and then what happens is um, a body of faculty and staff is convened to review the report and make any findings or any um, action that. Um, that may be punishment of some kind. So that's the process that I'm not directly involved in, though certainly I will, I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm interested in, but just so you know that, that that's a different track. I definitely had control over the audit in, in, circum, in saying this time. And, and in that sense, the audit is always incomplete because there's more we could have done. Um, I would have loved to have gotten more student feedback. Um, uh, we didn't have time to do focus groups, but we can in the future do that. So I consider the audit a start. So thanks for your question. Sorry, it's a long answer, Abby. Um, Sam, do you mind asking your question next? Of course. Hi, Father Brian. Hey, Sam. So, Good to see you. I noticed that although the audit does bring attention to the extent of campus safety's diversity in terms of demographics, it doesn't thoroughly describe any efforts to be more actively inclusive of the BIPOC community. So with that said, my question is, when and how will campus safety be held more accountable to embody values of diversity and inclusion so that the BIPOC community on campus uh, feel safe and cared for? Right, so I think that goes really the same question is to, is to hold them accountable to, to our expectations. And so part of what we, I wanna hear is, is how do we measure that from the students in the BIPOC community and, and their voice is central here, both our faculty, staff and students, how, how do we know that? How do we measure that? How, how do we provide ongoing feedback which says that campus safety, or frankly, any office, that I'm living up to that expectation? And one of my deep commitments as a president and as a Jesuit priest, frankly, is to make sure that our students have a sense of belonging here and safety here. So what we need to do is we can have metrics to that, right? We can assess complaints and we could put up structures. And, you know, one of the recommendations is to go through the policy manual, uh, which is very important because that's like a contract. But it's also to, to, to listen to our students to say, so what does belonging look like? And, and, and part of the reason why um, um, I, I think that the suggestion to go to student life is interesting is because it's really about relationship building, right? So what Judge Cordell said is it's they, 
what she wanted to move away from was enforcers to partners, like, like in a different way, but like you know, some of your mentors within student life. You're adults, so you're living your own lives, you're your own persons, but we consider our mentorship and partnership with you important. I, I don't think many students consider campus safety presently as partners. Um, I know that many in campus safety would like that, but I think we need to figure out how, what does that actually look like? And, and hearing from um, our different communities, including the BICOC community, would be very important to do that. And that's why I need to hear ideas from you, uh, suggestions about accountabilities. If we were revising position descriptions as, as, as we're looking at, what, what, what measure would you want in there? to make sure that we can say, okay, you're living up to that or not, besides generally saying, you know, acting in a way that it respects diversity, equity, and inclusion. But what, what, what other concrete things can we, can we um, ask of our, um, uh, our public safety officers? I think that's an important um, distinction. And I put in the chat for everyone, if you would like to offer some feedback, feel free to, to message me and I'll compile it into a document. Um, but I know that a lot of students had questions as well. So I want to balance the questions and the feedback. Please um, do. Please send them, Sierra. So we'll I'm looking, we're looking for ideas. Will do. Okay. Um, okay. Another question I'd like to have ask is Angel's question. Hi, Father O'Brien. Hi, Angel. Okay. So after reading, hello, after reading the audit really comprehensively, there's a bunch of recommendations that Judge Cordell provides that I think a lot of them are really valuable. But in the event that any of the recommendations provided can't or will not be fulfilled, can you commit to providing a justification yeah. or reasoning behind those decisions? Yes, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and most of them are reasonable. And, and the, the other thing is there are, um, and actually, I just need to figure, like, can I give you one example? uniforms. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a great idea. Apparently they did a uniform change 10 years ago. I think it's a great idea. I don't know what that actually will look like in the end, but I think that's a really, and that's an important, that's an important symbol. Um, but uh, it may just take some time to figure that one out. But yeah, I think uh, absolutely. That's what I owe you. Um, but can I also say there could be a hybrid? So like this came up recently, we I were talking about feedback loops. One thing she did not have in there, which I think is a good idea because it's used at other universities, is um, advisory boards, an advisory board. Like a lot of our organizations have, a, have advisory boards, but an advisory board of faculty, staff and students, which is standing, which that is, it's ongoing, that meeting regularly, giving direct feedback to the campus safety leadership. Um, and that's just another feedback. We need more feedback mechanisms, I think, uh, ongoing so that um, we're improving, we're, 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 we're challenging, we're holding accountable continually, just not once a year with an audit. But yes, I, I will. And can I say on this idea of student life, there's another, other universities have, so in terms of structure, some report to operations, which is what happens at Santa Clara. Some report to the university council. Some report to student affairs. There are four Jesuit universities that are report that campus safety is part of student life. Um, another is uh, reports to public affairs, sort of the external facing. But there might be another way for us to think about this. Is it a, is it a hybrid of those? Is, is it a, a hybrid approach that we are not thinking about? Um, so I'm asking to be creative and we're researching other universities. We have been doing that now for a while. So yes, Angel, you have my promise. Yeah, thank you. And an anonymous question to that is just like, how often do you anticipate these feedback surveys in terms of like um, the recommendation included periodic mental health, anti-bias, implicit bias trainings and campus-wide surveys? How would, they, how would you define periodic? Do you think it would be every year, quarterly? Uh, I, so I don't know exactly, but I can say training, training would be ongoing, right? So that would be like a monthly thing, right? That's sort of been a standard, I understand a standard practice in campus safety across the country. So, so, so definitely a monthly, like a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of offices on campus have ongoing training, professional development, we call it. In terms of the, 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 the feedback, I, I think that's, I think there are various levels there. I think it's, 
when when there's an interaction, there's feedback. With an advisory board, there's feedback. ASG did a student survey five years ago. You know, maybe they do it every year. Um, it maybe surveys not the way to go. Maybe there's another way to do it. I so I love your ideas. Send them. Send your ideas along. What was vital for us to be a better university, not just in public safety, but elsewhere, is we need more immediate feedback, and then we need to receive the feedback, and then tell you how we acted or not and why. Emma, I think your question would be helpful next, um, especially because it combines feedback with a question. All right, so um, hi, Father O'Brien. Uh, my name is Emma, I think we've met before, but um, I'm on SCU EMS um, and their leadership team as well as ASG. Um, and as I'm sure you and everyone else knows that we work very closely with campus safety. Um, and in the audit, it was mentioned briefly that we partner with them to help serve the campus community in a medical assessment type of way. Um, and I'm first wondering if there were any EMS calls that were assessed in the audit. Um, as there are many incidents that we see from a firsthand point mm -hmm. of view. Um, and then in addition to that, um, many people are apprehensive now to call us um, since we are connected so closely with campus safety. Um, as an EMT on campus, um, I've been asked a lot um, what the role of campus safety will be moving forward. Um, and some want us disconnected completely from them so that when we arrive, they're not arriving. Um, and so as we ask to suspend room searches um, and are thinking about altering their relationship with residents life, um, I'm wondering how that would also affect our relationship with them in the realm of SU EMS and what you envision happening in order to ensure that we can provide students a safe environment to assess them medically without having to worry about their fears. Yep. Yeah, no, Emma, thank you. It's a great question. I don't have the exact answer. So this is your feed, like this feedback is really helpful. There was, um, uh, um, okay, I don't know whether she, among the feedback that she got, I can't recall now whether any of it was related to, you know, the online feedback where you could write comments. Perhaps there was, uh, I just don't know, uh, descriptions of an EMS call, but clearly, she named this, the, the idea of sort of room searches as being an issue that came up among students. I know there's something Jeannie Rosenberger and, and others are sort of working through. Um, so I think it's a really important question because in the end we want, I mean, EMS just a big, I'm a big fan of EMS. I, I, I know the good work you do. I've seen it in action. Um, I, know, I, know, I know what you do and, and the amount of time you put into it. So thank you. But I think we need to hear more from EMS about how that's gonna work. Cause we have to make sure that students get the help. And if, if they're not getting the help, we gotta think of another way. So I don't have the answer for you, except to say we need, so I think Emma, we'll make sure we follow up with EMS on, on the, this sort of engagement with residents life. Cause often the, the engagements are in resident halls, but not always. So we'll follow up Emma. Thank you. Other Brian, I do recognize it's 819. Um, do you have some time to? No, I have all the time in the world for you all. So amazing. This is okay. the best part of the day, hanging out with students. I go to boring meetings all day, so I'd rather hang out with students. So I'm happy to stay for, for I know you guys have known a while. So um, yeah, go ahead, please. OK, thank you. I know we all really appreciate that. Um, OK, Cassidy, you want to ask your question? I think it's helpful. Hello, um, Father Brian. Um, I think mine's also related to type of um, personnel and relationships going forward past the audit. Um, from the audit, it does seem that your relationship with CSS is strained as individuals called into question your leadership ability. How will you go about dealing with your relationship with CSS so that change is effective, efficient, and will actually get done? Yeah, no, I think that's really great. I think what, what, I, what I made clear to um, Judge Cordell is like you just you put it all in there, even complaints against me. So and, and I, I will let those complaints speak for themselves. Um, I obviously I'm always willing to learn from people's reactions, including students. And I, I, I receive your feedback um, and I welcome it because um, I want to be better. I, I, uh, all I know is um, 
I'm committed to making this work. I'm committed to working with campus safety. They're members of the community. We, we need our students uh, to feel safe. I'm committed to change, to, to make that happen. And safety is in a variety of rewards, physical safety, mental safety, but a safety in a sense of th that our students feel a sense of belonging, that this is their home. And I'm deeply committed to that. So I think that's, the, for me, that's the end, right? And I know I just want to, I want to work with people who want to, who want to get there to that end. Um, and so I'm, I'm willing to work through any relationship, strained or otherwise, to, to get there. Um, I, one of my practices is always to be open to talk, to meet, and I'll meet with campus safety. I've said that I'll meet with them um, uh, soon to sort of hear their feedback about the report, get their ideas. But in the end, as leader of the university, I have to make decisions. I got to make expectations clear, and we're just going to move forward. And I really um, I want I want campus safety to to, to come with us. I, they're committed to serve. They want to serve, and I want to bring them along. Uh, with us to, the, to to do that, um, but it's a, it's a good question. It's a very actually also a very very human question, right? Um, how do you work through? For me, it's all about focusing on the on a common end we have, and I don't take any criticism personally. Um, I determine which criticism is constructive and helpful, and which is not which might distract me or us from the end we want to seek, which is to better serve our students. Thank you for that. Um, I think, so in terms of some anonymous questions, um, they're a bit shorter. What is the justification behind not reporting on CSS activities and budget in terms of like some sort of annual report? Um, and if there is no just like justification maybe that's some feedback that we could okay. start implementing. Um, I'm not sure I completely understand. So we reported in the audit, there's a budget, right? In terms of like an annual report, kind of like what the audit was, but like CSS oh, would yeah, yeah. Yeah. offer. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I, yeah. So it's like the annual report of, of sort of a, a very condensed form of the audit, like th these contacts, these incidences, sort of data. Um, it makes sense to me. I mean, we just reported them for 10 years. <laughs> so I think it makes better sense to do that a little bit more regularly. That's one of the recommendations. It makes good, it all goes to transparency, right? Right. There's some confidential information about people involved, but besides that, I think incidences, budget, stuff like that. Sure. Great. Another question anonymous was, how does Father O'Brien, how do you envision a holistic approach to redesign CSS without fully removing it. Um, will the mm. university plan on limiting campus safety's presence on campus by funding resources that are proactive rather than reactive since campus safety is reactive? Yeah, so I think that's I think that's exactly the point is right. So we want to we want to be proactive, not reactive. Um, we want to um, going back to what I said at the beginning about, you know, not beginning from law enforcement or 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 enforcer but partner um, th that campus safety official uh, officers that they are invested. We wanna make sure we have an environment which are invested in student success and student learning that they're real partners in that. Um, so um, I think I just say yes to that. And I think, can I just say that once some, like let's say, like the decisions are gonna be ongoing. Like we're gonna, in other words, I'll tell you, what I've decided, but like, if I decide about where campus safety reports based on your feedback, like that's just the beginning. Then, then there's got to be like, well, then how do you actually integrate campus safety into this new unit? I mean, that's going to take time because you have staff members involved. You got to think about like culturally, how do you move that work along? So, um, and I think Sierra, in the, in the feedback that people send you, I really want to hear about. Does this make does this make sense to put it under student life? And, and so please send Sierra that feedback. Um, th there are reasons for it. I mean, there are downsides too, I imagine, to that as well. Some people would say, well, actually some distance from student lives would be helpful. Um, so um, there are advantages to that. Maybe there's a way of doing a hybrid. I, I, yeah, I'm in the listening mode on that one, Sierra. So thank you. Yeah, definitely. And I think just to speak for everyone or most people here, I think there's this um, conversation about you can change the 
the outfits or the uniforms and you can change the symbols on the PowerPoints, but ultimately these are the same people no matter what they're wearing and what they're presenting. And so in order to give campus safety a facelift in a way, we really need to like look at like who are the people in the uniforms and are they, if they're clearly not changing and like how they they reacted to a lot of the audit questions, then does that mean that we genuinely have a complete new staff coming in? Um, and so I'm curious if you have any comments on that since that was a general theme yeah, no, in our I, conversations. I can understand that. I think, and that's, it's. It, it, I, I just agree with the, the, the main point there is that we need a campus safety, which is on board to a to a vision, this holistic vision that she reports is committed to transparency and accountability and student wellness, um, and so that's that's what we need. Can I? I think can I just end? Is there an, is there a last question? I just one final point I want to make before. Um. Yeah, I think Hawad wanted to ask a question, and then just generally, I'll. There's one more question that kind of ties it all up as well. If okay. we can ask that, and I think we're we basically made it through majority of the things. Okay. Good. Hawad, go for it. What? Hey, Father O'Brien. Thank you for being what? here. Um, I just wanted you to know that the audit is really popular amongst members of the university community that I've spoken with. Um, I think it has really sparked hope for change. Um, personally, I was mentioning this before you came on. I've interacted with CSS in a, several different ways. I worked for some time in the transportation office. I was a CF in Res Life, and in my spare time last year as a student canvasser, I had some confrontations with CSS when I was canvassing students to register them to vote without prior approval. So I like to think that I've seen them from a few different angles. And we've talked so far um, about the need for recruitment, promotion, retention that centers around diversity. Um, but I just wanted to express a certain viewpoint that I've heard from fellow students, which is that the reimagined apartment, uh, sorry, the reimagined department cannot include ex-law enforcement um, sort of on principle, um, not only in future facing recruitment, but also in our current rank and file personnel. Um, in the sense that if we are reimagining the apartment, the department to move away from policing and towards community care, that it's just not compatible with having and recruiting ex-law enforcement. So I just wanted to know what you think of that and whether you think that that's something that we can achieve uh, in the near future. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that feedback. I, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great question for us to explore. So I, I don't, I need, I have to really think through that. It's a really big question and it goes to the reimagining part which mm -hmm. we're in the process of doing, but I appreciate that feedback a lot. And the last question is kind of like, we have the audit, now what? What is the timeline looking like? How are you delegating this and right. to others? And how, where do students come in um, in terms of helping, but also recognizing that like the onus can't be on us all yeah. the time to do the work for the, especially particularly the BIPOC community. Yeah, no, this is, no, I, I get that. Uh, I want feedback to the extent that we want to give it uh, and there's continue to offer it. Uh, I want to be transparent. It's all out there. The, the reports there. Um, uh, timing, again, some recommendations we're already doing. Uh, the, the bigger ones about organization and the reimagining, I think that, that you know, I want to, I want to make a decision th this quarter about the organization because that, that, I think that's sort of a, a that's a big one that reimagining piece. But the centerpiece of that is where does campus safety report? That's that to me is a decision to be made shortly. And then some of the other recommendations will need more student feedback in, like feedback loops. Is there an advisory board? How do we compose it? Some are recommendations we're already enacting. Great. My last point. I, I just just stepping back and I, I, first of all, it's great to be with you. And I, I just. Uh, um, I appreciate everything you do for Santa Clara at a time where Santa Clara, this is a, we're at a unique moment in our history and it's hard to acknowledge what this, this last year has been like for you. Um, so thank you and uh, I express my care and love for you. Um, big picture, what I wanna to move towards is where the way of proceeding at Santa Clara is defined by restorative justice. And that's a principle both in the Catholic tradition and the secular tradition, which looks at ways of relating on a deeper level, where we, we consider how we relate to, our, to one another in a restorative way. So like, for instance, when there are harm, when there's disagreement, when there's a rupture of relationship, 
we try to repair that relationship in a way that there is both truth telling and justice making. And where we aim not just for retribution, there must be accountability, of course, but also restoration or reconciliation of all parts of the community that have been ruptured, right? And so it's a holistic way of looking at our community rather than just as transactional or an incident involving just two people, usually that involves a whole community. And it, 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 it's, uh, it demands a different way of, of, um, of speaking, of acting, of listening, of relating. And uh, you're gonna hear more about that from me and from Provost Kloppenberg and Margaret Russell, because I, this I've learned, and this is not just from the audit, but something I've been talking about for a year now, that if we want to actually transform culture, restorative justice might be the way to go for us because it's true to who we are. We actually have a restorative justice program within student conduct, but it's so much more than that. It could deal with roommate stuff. It could deal with campus safety. It could deal with um, harmful impacts of different kinds or disagreements, but I think it's a, it's a way for us. And so I, I hope to engage ASG in those conversations about restorative justice. So. Thank you so much, and please direct more feedback to Sierra. Thanks, Father O'Brien. Will we be expecting any email like as a follow up to the audit from you in terms of some sort of roadmap or timeline on kind of what's next so students broadly know since not everyone could come tonight, of course? Um, yeah, there'll eventually be an email about acting on the recommendations. Yes, but I'm now in listening mode, so I just need time to listen and to reflect and to to make sure any decision I make is informed. Definitely. Well, we'll be sending over feedback as well as getting some feedback from the broader student community via, via social media. Great, excellent. Good, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank Great, everyone. You Thanks, thank appreciate you. it. With that, um, we'll, we can kind of, kind of shift towards this next part or the, the ending. We can shift towards roundtable remarks. Um, how do you guys think that went? Um, and again, we can adjourn early if we want, and we can stop the recording if you guys want to have more honest, um, if you guys don't want to be limited in what you're able to say. Um, but personally, I, I, I think it, it helped a little bit, but again, um, I, I understand that Father O'Brien was definitely like, as he's called it, like in listening mode. And I think it's, it's valuable for him. It, it's good that he's taking in a lot of feedback from like all stakeholders of the university. Um, but at this point, I feel like a lot of us, like we've waited for almost, it's, it's, it's going to be two quarters if it's, if this is done at the end of the quarter. And it's like, um, like, I, I'm just worried that like things aren't going to happen and they're not going to happen soon enough. Um, and I, 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 I did wish that he was, he, he would have been able to give a little bit more of a concrete like roadmap of, oh, okay, we'll have things done by week five or have things done by week eight. Um, he wasn't able to provide that, but I guess that's going to be on us to continue to follow up with him to make sure that such a roadmap is presented um, to the general student body. Um, but with that, if you have any like thing you want to share, um, and, and please, there's a lot of um, people that are still here um, that aren't in Senate. If you have any comments or questions or concerns, feel free to voice them now. Um, and we can start with Anne. Justin, would yeah. you like me to screen share the current feedback? Um, that I have, and then we can build off of that. Would that be helpful? I can't hear you. I, something's wrong. We I, still can't hear you. Okay, well, I'm going to say you put your thumb up, so. Um, he said right. that we got it. Um, I think it's still important that we have a place where uh, some kind of forum next week where there can be a discussion about more about what student want, students want to, um, especially because he is in listening mode and really wants to see more of student concerns. Um, and I also think it's important we put on like our ASG Instagram, all of that um, jazz, just to get as much feedback as possible while we're here. I think it's a good, and it's frustrating to not know like, okay, what's a timeline? What's happening here? What do you want? What are you gonna prioritize? And like, just have all of those things down, but it's a sign that really um, different perspectives are being considered. And I think that's something that we need to reach out to people beyond ASG. Um, yeah, that's a good idea, Google form. Um, and just have different avenues for input while we're in this phase. So then 
moving forward, we can actually say, all right, this is what all this looks like. These are continuing themes. These are things students really truly want. Here you go. Yeah, I mean, I just had a little bit of reaction to that. And I know that we're, um, that he did say what, that he's in listening mode and that there's a lot of like student um, feedback that's necessary, but I do worry that it seems like a lot of the responsibility for change is being placed on students and particularly um, BIPOC students. Um, I think that an advisory council, like I think all these are great ideas, but I think it continuously um, pushes the responsibility to hold campus safety accountable um, onto students and people of color. And so I think that that's something that alerted me for sure and that I'm a little worried about and that we should definitely keep an eye on going forward, um, especially in with talking with students and things like that. Um, because while like we want to do what we can to make the campus safe, um, it is also the responsibility of administration to take the responsibility to keep us safe as well. Um. I would, for, before I talk, I would like to come. I have an incident behind me. It's not smoke. Well, it's smoke from an incident. But anyway, to respond to what Cassidy said, um, it to be like so transparent, that was very emotionally taxing for me. I feel like throughout this whole process, I've just been so upset because the the way that campus has handled this, especially because when all of these incidents first happened, there was so much feedback. There was so much that students had to say. Um, and now they're like, okay, well, what were you saying? Like, that's that's frustrating. At least the, the nicest word I could use is frustrating. That's, and, and I'm not saying that this is all on Father O'Brien and I completely appreciate his time here. And I love that he's in listening mode, that's great. But what about when we were sharing? And so, yeah. Thank you, Cassidy, for addressing that. But um, I did want to talk about one of the suggestions that I made kind of based on what he was talking about, about like a QR code on a card or something. I think that it would, if that were implemented, the way that to me it would feel even effective is if there was a limit as to how much negative feedback that officers could get before they are terminated. Because, um, honestly, like that's the most effective thing. Like if you are going to continue having negative experiences with students and students are able to actively review you, even though it's again, our responsibility to do that, it would be, we need like feasible things that are going to happen to them if they continue to get negative feedback. And then I also um, was thinking that I think it should be campus safety officers responsibility to interact with students. And I think that they should do that in a way outside of them policing us. I think that it should be their responsibility as a campus safety officer to have casual experiences with us. And I kind of think that at this point, that's not something that they're willing to do. So I feel that a quota should be implemented about how much, how many experiences they could have in that sense. I don't know what that would look like, but I don't think it's my responsibility to know what that would look like. But that's just how I feel about it. Juan? Yeah, thank you, Justin. Um, I think following up on what Zakia said, uh, personally, I, I think the position that ASG needs to adopt at this time uh, in order to help expedite and accelerate this process is actually, and, and this sounds counterintuitive, I think is to discourage uh, further listening, further feedback, uh, further dialogue and, and discourse amongst the student body or between the student body and CSS as facilitated by administration until we see a timeline and roadmap for at the bare minimum the implementation of the majority, if not the entirety of what the audit calls for. Um, I think we've really reached an impasse and, and Zakia voices this well in the sense that there is really no capacity for advocacy or, or meaningful activism uh, during a time in which these two major incidents have occurred. And as Justin has, has mentioned in the past, have been delayed and actually have been pacified um, by you know, patience for the audit, patience for the investigation. Uh, I, I think if, if the university and 
the administration aren't moving to implement these things as soon as possible, then we really don't have a function in the meantime. So I'm against advisory councils, I'm against working groups, I'm against task forces, um, and frankly, I'm against individual projects to try and push specific pieces of the audit. Uh, it should really be implemented in its entirety, entire uh, T as soon as possible. I do think, sorry, um, I think a big frustration, something I feel it's like, well, if there's the feedback that you wanted, we have the audit, we have all these recommendations. What's the point in talking to students and saying, which recommendations do you think we need? Like this, all of these recommendations should be adopted and more. So that's where I, when I see like the need for more conversations or if people want to have conversations, there are people are tired of this and there's here are the things to do. So go put these in action and then take the additional feedback we have from students and then pass that on and say, while well, you're listening, here are some other things too. If we're going to have feedback sessions, I think that is where this lies. I don't think it should be, oh, like which point do you want the most? Take all of them, they're all issues. Um, and then what else can we do? And I think that is a good thing that can come out of more conversations if people want to have those conversations. Um, Paula? Um, yeah, thank you. To, to go off of that, I think, you know, for so long, we, we've been in feedback mode and uh, the whole student body has been in feedback mode. Um, and it's been really bottom up and for so long that feedback has been we need like top down like we that's what we need um i'm like very frustrated right now <laughs> i'm like physically frustrated um yeah that's just what i wanted to say really quickly i think like on the one hand like there 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 are probably like hundreds of changes that um that the administration can and will implement now that are like beyond obvious for us. And it's 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 a waste of our time really to be pushing on those obvious changes. Cause like, if we're gonna bring it up, it's like, oh, okay, we're gonna do it anyways, right? That being said though, I, I do still, I still, I still, I still do see some value in quote unquote listening sessions. And the reason I say that is because I'm worried that, you know, if we move beyond this point of listening and it's action from the administration, after they act, will they still listen? And, and, and perhaps the, 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 greater, the, the greater concern, and, and I think what we should be fo fo focusing on instead is, okay, like we're done listening. I mean, we're done talking. We just want you guys to do work. We want you guys to implement like concrete like actions. And then from there, make it clear that like, we still wanna be involved in the process. And like, after you give us a, an entire list of here are all the things that we will do and we will implement with like a roadmap of, okay, here's how many years, how many months this will, this will be done. After we can, if we can take a look at that and from there on critique, it's going to be a lot more productive than right now, than what we're doing right now. Because again, it's like, there's hundreds of different things that we could do to kind of do that. But th 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 that's also not to say though, like once, once Father O'Brien and once the administration, like, you know, has a concrete set of plans, right? And if that concrete set of plans involve, you know, moving campus safety underneath student life. And after they do that, we realize, wait, we don't want them to do that. Or afterwards you realize, wait, we don't want campus safety to exist on campus at all. If those, if, if those, like, if, if, that, if, if that feedback comes after they've invested like hours and hours and hours, and honestly, like hundreds of thousands of dollars in this reshuffling, it's going to be a lot harder for them to implement those changes after the fact, which is why, like, if there are any, like, kind of big things that were like, oh my goodness, great. Like you can implement all these recommendations, but we still need X, Y, and Z. If those X, Y, and Z involve like our complete like zero, zero to 100, like 180 shift from like what the recommendations are, I think those need to be vocalized now. Those need to be like communicated now because later down the line, I think it's gonna be too late. Um, and I feel like if, and I feel like this is a really good segue towards like, what do we want this week three event to look like? Do we want this week three event to look like us as ASG, we are going to put, put forth, here's what we want to see? Or is it beyond that? Is it, is it, is it kind of just going to be more of a, like, I don't really know what this event like week three would look like actually. Now.
Um, just going off quickly of what like Justin said, like just something really quickly that came up in my mind when Justin was talking is like a lot of questions that we posed, um, he didn't really have full answers for and he had like not even thought about like Hawad's question and like my question, there were a few others as well. Like he seemed like he hadn't looked at that perspective yet because there's just so much going on. There's, I'm sure that he hasn't had the opportunity to attend to everything. And I guess like what I'm saying is like, yeah, we don't want to keep having to tell them what we want, but at the same time, like once they figure everything, figure everything out, they're never going to figure everything out. But once they figure out the things that they're going to do, um, <laughs> um, it would be really disappointing if we had not said what we needed to say and they hadn't like at least heard it. Cause like, um, like today he like made a direct promise to Angel, you know what I mean? And like, I'm not saying that we need Actually, I am saying that it would be great to have a million direct promises. Actually, that is what I'm saying. But um, I think that there is a lot of power in bringing up things that maybe they haven't thought about. Like the fact that he just couldn't answer some of our questions means that they haven't considered them to the point where he has an answer. And I think that bringing them up at least, at least shows that like, it was brought up so that if we were to complain later and be like, why weren't these things done? Um, they couldn't claim that they didn't know about it. So that's just my two cents. So kind of, okay. Um, backtracking on about being upset that Never mind. Was, what? Sorry. Go for it, sorry. Um, I'm not backtracking on what I said about being, you know, upset about continually being asked but I do think that Justin you made a, some really really good points and I think that thinking about the event that we would have um, for one I think it's important to validate the feelings of students because I like Paula said like a lot of people have said so far um, it's it's hard it's <laughs> difficult it's frustrating especially for BIPOC students because at this point, it's just like, you know, but that's not the point. But I think that we should validate those feelings for students because um, that's something that they need to get off their chest. But I do also really think that if they are finally listening, we need to take advantage of that. Like, if I've been waiting this long for it, I'm not going to be mad that they're finally doing it now. So I feel like in some way, we should have like what CR is doing now, like a way to compile all of what they're saying and then a way to um, present that to Father O'Brien, to admin, whoever, in a way that's not overwhelming so that they can kind of take a cumulative look at it and be able to apply it in a real way. Juan, your hand was up. I don't know if it was from an earlier response or an earlier question. Uh, no, it was up for a, a new point, I guess, uh, specifically speaking to uh, the idea of a sort of week three or rather after today, uh, ASG involvement or event or campaign. Uh, and, and I say campaign just because I, I fear that uh, some kind of event would, would end up being uh, a sort of another discussion or breakdown, which again, I should say I'm not opposed to. Um, I think there is a, a really crucial uh, role we have to play in making sure that students are seeing what the audit says, uh, remembering this entire timeline of events. Uh, we don't want the uh, really awful events from the summer and the fall uh, to go forgotten, although I don't think that's happening. Um, but I think one thing uh, that ASG uh, could do more and, and doesn't do as much at this time, which we could consider on this issue, um, is show and build a, consens a consensus amongst the campus community. Um, so I, I think there is an opportunity for us to actually uh, draft or compose, whether it's a resolution or some other kind of petition, uh, our uh, support uh, for the recommendations of the audit. And if we do have, uh, like what you said, Justin, specific grievances, uh, specific addendums or, or additional changes we want to see, uh, ultimately, I, I think what we could do as ASG is really go out there, all of us, every single one of us, uh, try and gather support from our peers 
uh, for these actions to be implemented again with any changes that we want uh, included from our own uh, conversations with one another in the student body and really push for that to take place as soon as possible and build agency for ourselves. I've heard so many folks tonight mention that they're, they feel like they're just waiting. Um, and, and now that the audit report is out and now that we've heard um, Father O'Brien's kind of current position um, that we really need to take matters into our own hands and say that what we want as a student body now is really quick action um, on uh, provided recommendations and additional items as well. Uh, as Anne mentioned, it's, it's not going to end here in, in any capacity. So for example, something like 5,000 signatures, I think would be absolutely really impressive um, if that's something that we were able to accomplish in the course of the next few weeks uh, in, in winter quarter, something that has never been done before, I don't think. From faculty, staff, and students, alumni, or just students? Uh, whoever is supportive, yeah. I actually think that'd be a really good idea. Um, and if that's something that we, want, we would want to do, I know you mentioned we would we, there'd be a dent or in like what um Sierra says addendums can include any grievances and I think that the grievances would include Hawad like you, the point that you made um, about not hiring any any ex law enforcement personnel um, and, and I'm sure like everyone here still has some personal grievances about like you know like maybe um, they um, you know, it, it shouldn't be campus safety that goes around with EMTs like during their rounds. I don't know if that's something that you think, Emma, but like so something like that, like, like those grievances, those that we, we need to do more research and we need to do more, um, like we, we need to ask the student body, like specifically like, like, okay, like I think it's kind of assumed that like everything in like this resolution that, or, or this petition or whatever thing that we would put forth would include would include us supporting most of the most if not all of the recommendations that came forth from the audit but kind of the plus ones like what what are those plus ones and if we are to kind of aggregate all of that together the the the, the resolution i mean the audit itself including these grievances and to get five thousand signatures on that i think it'd be very difficult for for for, for the administration to not listen to that Whereas if it's just one person speaking up on, on a specific point during, during a forum, it's a lot easier for them to ignore that. Um, that being said, that's going to be a lot of work, um, but I think it's work that I'm personally willing to put in. Um, and I think, Ciara, like, in terms of this week three, in, in this week three event, do you feel like you have a better understanding of what needs to be done? Um, or do you think we should um, hash that a little bit more? Yeah. First and foremost, I just uh, I just appreciate all of you. I know it's really it's getting to be way past Senate time, um, but I think in terms of next week, how we need to approach this is kind of do some sort of you know organizing in terms of highlighting what we really want to see come out of like what are those grievances as Hawad pointed out, and then maybe formatting the like if we want to do a petition I just want to like once again make sure that we are conveying to admin that like we appreciate that they're listening as Justin said um because the last thing I want to happen is they the university does things on their own and those things do not align and like they were just tone deaf and then they're but then we ostracized and alienated them because we're like well now it's time for you to do your job we don't want to give feedback kind of thing so I think there, there's a very fine line and um, type of thing we need to dance around in a way. Um, but besides that, in terms of next week, I think it'd be good to see a lot of senators and just ASG, ASG members in general at an event like that, while also encouraging other students to show up. But I think the general vibe I got from tonight was that <laughs> Father Brian didn't, I don't think he was expecting to answer so many questions and he just wanted to hear feedback, um, which I totally understand. So I think if you can continue to provide me feedback within the next, I don't know, day by tomorrow so that I can send him over everything because I also don't wanna convey that we don't have any feedback to give and that like the status quo of the audit is good, good as is. 
So I'll send over the feedback to him tomorrow and say, this is what we have so far. However, we'll be gathering more next week, but this is something he should go off of for in the meantime. I don't know, Justin, did that answer your question adequately? Um, and, and I think with, with Hawad's like suggestion, like it would be in the form of a resolution, but it would really just be a proposal, but, but this would be, you know, a reimagining of the campus safety as said, like by the student body and, and what we would like to propose. Obviously, we would borrow a lot from the audit and, and use a lot of the recommendations from the audit. And I think this event, this, this event next week should be focused on um, kind of putting forth, okay, like here's what we know. Here's all the recommend recommendations that like come from the audit. That's already a given. We're not going to talk about that unless someone disagrees with one of those recommendations, but then also putting forth additional recommendations. Are there you know, 10, 20, 50 additional things that we would want to add as an addendum? And, if, and, and, then, and then from week three, we can do research on our own end, um, you know, whether or not these, these addendums are something that like the student body supports and would sign a petition over. And if there's widespread, and if there's widespread support for those addendums, they should be added. Um, and then I would imagine a week four, week five date for us to, a uh, week four, week five, dead, probably week five deadline for us to not only present that resolution, but also to get as many signatures for that resolution as possible. Um, does that sound like a good plan? Any suggestions, concerns? Oh, can I add something? One last thing. Go for it. Um, I also know that like a lot of you were in the camp of like, we don't need CSS at all and abolish them. And especially when Dr. Um, Ball came in last qu quarter to kind of reaffirm the fact that we don't need them. I understand that maybe Judge Cordell's recommendations or kind of what we've heard tonight is maybe discouraging or frustrating to you all. Um, but I just, I personally think that like because in her audit she didn't directly say anything along those lines that that would just kind of although it, it's not off the table I think it would just be something that is a battle that we will most likely lose so I really want to make sure that we're approaching the things that really make sense and are urgent in terms of how we can improve CSS substantially um in the in the near future like in the next six months upon graduation or upon my graduation the senior graduation but upon um june also as we as we kind of do more research on on again like what those grievances are if if, if there is kind of this if there is kind of a sense of okay, like we're gonna say this, but we we know like we're 90% sure that they're not gonna implement it. I don't think it's, I don't think it's not, I don't think just because that's the case, it's not worth us putting forth a resolution for that. I think if anything, we can have like an additional, like a second resolution, like a, a main resolution in terms of like a proposal that we can get like 5,000 signatures for, and then kind of a separate resolution kind of like if, if, if there are people who, who do not think campus safety should exist at all, and they can come up with a valid proposal that would work. And again, like they are, at the end of the day, they are in listening mode. And, 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 and we were to kind of compile that into like another, okay, here's like, like what David Ball would suggest, right? And a proposal that he would be in, in, support, in support of. And, if, and this is like a complete new perspective, something that we, wouldn't, that we haven't really considered or we haven't really looked into. You know, if we were to also put out, put out like vote on a res resolution like that, and if that resolution were to also pass, um, I, I don't necessarily think that that would take away from any for, from a from, from like a proposal that we would put. I think if anything, it would strengthen it. Although that being said, if the if the two of them obviously um, contradict one another, then we would have to kind of um, we would we would have to work that out. But I don't think it's not worth like pursuing. Just to put that out there. Um, and with that, it is now 9 p.m. Um, I know you guys all have a lot of work. Um, this is our longest Senate. Wow, oh my goodness. This is what Senate used to look like my, first, my freshman year. Um, but yeah, um, I think 
if there aren't any other comments, questions, or concerns, um, I would entertain. <laughs> I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. A motion from Angel. Second. Second. KJ, all in favor, say aye. 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 Around for a couple of minutes if I want to chat.